The Trumpet Daily Program begins right now. Today's world news, what it means, where it's taking us. I bring you the one and only possible message of world peace. This is a message of hope, tremendous hope. And he said unto me, you must prophesy again. And now, The Trumpet Daily with Stephen Flurry. Hello again, everyone, and welcome back to the Trumpet Daily Radio Show. We're coming to you live from our Edstone studio here in the UK. Of course, it's broadcast live across North Edmond on KPCG, and it's streamed around the world at kpcg.fm and also at the trumpet.com website. Coming up on today's program, we'll continue with our Bible study series on the subject of giving up the world. We've gotten some really good feedback on that, and uh, if I have time, I'll get to an email uh, in response to yesterday's show uh, later on today as well. Well, today's September 11th, the 19th year anniversary of the attack on the, uh, the Twin Towers back in 2001, and also the Pentagon. Uh, those of us, uh, I guess, uh, early to middle age and older certainly remember that that day well. There was a piece at the American Greatness today, uh, 9-11, 19 years later, and the subhead said, can we ever recover that patriotic unity we had in the aftermath of that horrible day, or has 2020 set us on a path to utter disintegration? And we've uh, talked even recently, I think over the summer, where we just looked back at... uh, some of those national anthems in the months after 9-11, and just the, the national show of unity and togetherness. It was short-lived. We said that it would be at the trumpet. But what a contrast. What a contrast to today. There was a piece in the September issue of the trumpet, just the, the recent issue with the statues on the cover, It says, 9-11 and beautiful humility. September 11, 2001 was a clarifying moment that sobered and humbled America. People put their lives on hold. We watched, we cried, contemplated, connected with family, clung to our loved ones, and tried to understand. We tried to understand. We rallied, though. We rallied around the, the flag. We rallied around the president. This was President Bush at ground zero after the attack, clip two. I can hear you. (laughs) I can hear you. The rest of the world hears you. And the people. And the people who knocked these buildings down will hear all of us soon. USA, USA. There he was at ground zero saying that he hears you. The whole world hears us. This article at the September issue of The Trumpet, it says, That afternoon at the nation's capital, U.S. representatives from both parties gathered and stood united. How about that? Congress united. Behind the Speaker of the House who told the nation, We will stand together. We will stand together, Democrats, Republicans. After a moment of silence, they spontaneously sang, God bless America. God bless America. Congress, men and women, outside on the steps of Congress, singing together, God bless America, telling the American public, we stand together. And then who can forget all of the, the, the news clips from that time and what was happening all across the nation. This was a CBS News segment uh, just a little while after, I think actually a few days after the attack on 9-11, clip five. 
Across the nation, flags have been flying off the shelves. I've probably gone to eight or nine places. There are no flags. Walmart sold 200,000 yesterday and put more on order today. This is probably the most direct way for the common citizen to go show his support. I knew some people on those planes, and I feel like I have to do something. Ever since the disaster, a wave of patriotism has been spreading across America. America is united. We are strong. We are stronger than ever. From blood drives to passing out freedom ribbons. If it's anything red, white, and blue, it's going to sell. At times like this, it's what we do in America. We, the people, pull together, and united we stand. We cease to be New Yorkers and Texans and become Americans really, really quick when the need is, is there. You have to wonder if CBS would ever do a segment like that again. United we stand. Anything red, white, and blue, just flying off the shelves. This is, uh, well, this is the best way to show our support. Go buy a flag. Flags were flying off the shelves. The wave of patriotism, said CBS. And then, of course, who can forget all of the, the sporting events from that fall? The fall of 2001. Here's Sammy Sosa hitting a home run. And then watch what he does when he rounds the bases. Clip three. Here comes the 3-0. Sammy hits a high fly ball. Deep right center. Back goes Merced to the wall and right looking up. Leaping. That ball is gone for a home run. Sammy Sosa has hit one into the basket. Just to the right of the 368 sign. He's carrying an American flag around the bases. And the Cubs lead one to nothing. That's Sammy Sosa. I think he came originally from the Dominican Republic. Came up to the United States, a baseball star, made millions and millions of dollars. I think he's famous for saying that uh, baseball was very, very good to him. So was the United States. He was carrying the U.S. flag around the bases. And the crowd, the crowd in unison cheered on. There were quite a few scenes in Yankee Stadium that fall as they made a deep run into the playoffs and even the World Series. This is, uh, I forget which series this is. I think it's early on in the playoffs. But here's Lee Greenwood singing, uh, there's bits of it here, singing the national anthem at Yankee Stadium. Just look at these scenes, clip four. Well, there's pride in every American heart And it's time we stand and say Proud to be an American, who very least I know I'm free. And I won't forget the men who died, who gave that right to me. And I gladly stand up next to you and defend her still today. Cause there ain't no doubt I love this land. God bless the USA. Proud to be an American, where at least I know I'm free. And I won't forget the men who died, who gave their rights to me. But I gladly stand up next to you and defend her still today. But there ain't no doubt I love this land. God bless. Yankee Stadium in the, the Bronx back in 2001, one of the flags flying high, damaged, ripped apart during the 9-11 attacks, and yet proudly flown across Yankee Stadium. Lee Greenwood wearing his <laughs> Stars and Bars jacket. Everybody cheering on. That's in New York City. You can uh, chalk that up to scenes that 
we're probably not going to see again in the United States. And then our, our, our favorite, this goes to the end of the World Series. This is over in Arizona. It's a little bit of a longer clip, but, uh, well, we looked at it this morning and we couldn't cut anything out. I think, I, I think we might have even played this a few years ago. But this is uh, trumpet, a trumpeter Jesse McGuire. He's performing the national anthem just prior to Game 7 of the 2001 World Series that was uh, between the Yankees and the Diamondbacks. Enjoy, clip one. reaction there uh, at the end for those of you just hearing the the audio stream that's the uh, african-american jesse mcguire <laughs> stirring up the crowd with his stirring rendition of the national anthem together with fireworks there at diamondback stadium a stealth bomber flying across the stadium and you heard the enthusiastic cheering in unison all together this article in the recent trumpet, it says, In the weeks that followed, we shared a common loss. We saw life's fragility. We realized how easily we get distracted and consumed by trivialities. We quieted down. We listened. We reached out to each other. This monstrous atrocity caused immense grief but also an impulse to set aside petty vanities and to become more mindful, more caring, and more thankful. The nation, and to some degree even the world, recognized the reality that there is evil out there, and if we are divided, we are vulnerable. If we're divided, we're vulnerable. It says, to one degree or another, people united. Acts of charity increased. American flags flew. You saw that in these clips. They couldn't, ha they couldn't hold on to enough of them in the, the shops. It says the catastrophe of 9-11 even turned Americans' thoughts toward God. Religious themed signs appeared everywhere. Church attendance rose dramatically. People talked a lot about prayer, healing, forgiveness, faith. It says, finally, it is tragic that it takes such shocking tribulation to turn our minds in that direction. But the fact is, suffering, suffering brings clarity. Yes, and you see over and again in the Bible, God pleading with his people, God pleading with nations, God pleading with the world, pleading with them to turn 
and then eventually sending that rod of correction upon those who didn't heed the warning. I believe I mentioned this yesterday, Isaiah 55, 7, let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return unto the eternal. This is what God's looking for. It says if we do that, he'll have mercy on us. 2 Chronicles 7, verse 14, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. If my people will just repent and turn from their wicked ways, I'll intervene, I'll help them. I'll bring them together. I'll have mercy upon them. I'll abundantly pardon, as I read yesterday. One final passage. This is Ezekiel 23, 21. It says, But if the wicked will turn from his sins, I think this might actually be Ezekiel 18. It says, But if the wicked will turn from all his sins, that he has committed, and keep all my statutes, and do that which is lawful and right, he shall surely live and shall not die. If he'll just turn from the sins, keep the statutes, do what's lawful and right, then he's going to live. He won't die. He won't have to be punished like this. It says, all his transgressions that he has committed, they shall not be mentioned unto him. It says, in his righteousness that he has done, he shall live. See, there's repentance. God just blotting out that past because we've returned to him. We've turned to God. Again, in verse 27, he says, when the wicked man turns away from his wickedness that he has committed and doeth that which is lawful and right, he shall save his soul alive. Look at what happens. Look at the blessings that come into our lives when we return to God. One listener, as I, as I alluded to at the start, writing in in response to yesterday's program, talking about how difficult it is to forsake the ways of this world, to give up this world and all of its distractions, and to return to God, or to turn to Him. This September 2020 Trumpet article, it says, even as America reacted to, to 9-11 and its aftermath, Gerald Flurry forecast that the unity would not last and the nation would grow weaker because it was not addressing the fundamental cause of the disaster. That was the trumpet forecast back at the end of 2001. The, the momentary peace, unity, the coming together, that show of patriotism, the unity would not last, we said, because we haven't, we haven't addressed the fundamental cause of the problem, the fundamental cause of the attack. It gets back to our sins. Well, then you fast forward 19 years, and look at where we are. Look at the climate we're in. Look at the division in the United States. Listen to these people, these commentators, these politicians who hate their president. They're not talking about coming together on the steps of Congress. They're not talking about singing God bless America in unison. They're talking about this, clip six. We have a president who is a liar and is willing to kill Americans. Homicide, the mass murder, and it's gotten to a point, it's, it's not just inexcusable, it's genocidal. Because so many people died as a result of what Donald Trump admitted to on these tapes. He's killing Americans. Many of those deaths, Mr. President, are on you. But this is what I would call negligent genocide. Think about what he did not do, and it's almost criminal. There are thousands of my fellow New Yorkers who are dead right now, and it can be directly attributed to the president's uh, lack of action. Donald Trump caused the COVID outbreak in New York. And so there you go. He's guilty of, ma- the President of the United States, guilty of mass murder, uh, negligent genocide, 
just unhinged, this kind of rhetoric. And we wonder why people are taking to the streets, blowing up buildings, looting shops, department stores, even killing one another. The big reveal this week, as I said yesterday, Bob Woodward's book, how that he has tapes. He has tapes, believe it or not, saying that President Trump was, well, he didn't want the the whole nation to panic. He didn't want the whole nation to just absolutely react irrationally. Here's ABC's John Carl confronting President Trump yesterday about, well, just listen. Listen to the way he talks to the president. Listen to you, to it for yourself. Clip seven. Why did you lie to the American people, and why should we trust what you have to say That's now? That's a terrible question, and the phraseology, I didn't lie. What I said is we have to be calm, we can't be panicked. And your question, the way you phrase that is such a disgrace. It's a disgrace to ABC Television Network. It's a disgrace to your employer. And that's the answer. And so there you go, back and forth. All these people, keeping track of the 20,000 lies. This was Brian Stelter last uh, Sunday, clip nine. Why keep acting like things are normal after 20,000 false and misleading claims? This week, the lies continued. Well, why keep acting like things are normal? Look, we've got to take action. We've got to bring him down. 20,000 false and misleading claims? 20,000! And so the conspiracy, in, in wide open view, it continues. Over at American Greatness, this article I mentioned at the very top, it says, if the immediate consequence of 9-11 was a feeling of strong national unity... Its long-term effect was the opening up of a huge national divide. On one, and again, keep in mind what the trumpet was saying back 19 years ago. It says, on one side were those who loved America, cherished its founding principles, and recognized the attacks on 9-11 as an assault on those uh, principles of, uh, by totalitarian ide- ide- ideolo- ideologues. Sorry. <laughs> on the other side were those who reacted to 9-11 by deciding that America's enemies must have have a point, and by uh, by buying the claim that America's legacy is one not of freedom and equality, but of prejudice and exploitation. So even the seeds of division, you see, they were there. They were there 19 years ago, and they've come into full bloom today, for sure. It says, on 9-11, who would have imagined that Islam would soon be widely depicted as a religion not of totalitarian conquest, but of innocent victimhood, and that Sharia apologists like Ilhan Omar and Rashida Tlaib would be congresswomen. Who could have imagined this 19 years ago? What does it say about where we are today? And you hear all of those beautiful anthems singing in New York, that beautiful trumpet rendition in Phoenix, Arizona. What a contrast. Last night, the NFL had its opening night game. The Chiefs versus the, the, the Titans. I think this game actually had fans uh, attending. Well, I know it did because they, blew, they booed the show of solidarity between the two teams. Following the, I think it was the black anthem. So now they've got the national anthem And then the black anthem, I'm not sure why the other races are left out. If you're going to have two, you might as well have five, six, or seven, I guess. you got to be fair, right? You've got to count everybody. How many anthems will, will we have in the end as we balkanize, as we separate into our tribes? Two anthems of all things in the opening night game for the National Football League. And judging by the booing, there's quite a few people that are unhappy with this. You can look at the Gallup poll, a recent one. People who have a positive view of sport, the sports industry. 2019, it was 45%. In 2020, it's 30%. It's dropped 15%. People who positively view the sports industry. Now, last night's game, you had this, I guess, two top-tier teams, the Texans and the Chiefs. Well, the Chiefs won the Super Bowl. 
And they featured two very popular, uh, very wealthy black quarterbacks, Chiefs and the Texans. And listen to Jason Whitlock's commentary. This is outstanding. He said, we sh- he's a sports writer, one of the few conservatives in sports. He says, we should be joyful tonight. We should celebrate the achievements of football. We should honor and celebrate James Harris, uh, Joe Gilliam, Vince Evans, Rodney Pete, Randall Cunningham, Warren Moon, Steve McNair, Donovan McNabb, and all of the quarterbacks, uh, these would be black quarterbacks, who paved the way or paved the path for Mahomes, Watson, and Wilson. These, these modern-day black quarterbacks. This is an opportunity to celebrate the achievements of the NFL, the inclusivity of the NFL. We should say their names and express joy for the road we've traveled and hurdles we've cleared and the limitless possibilities in front of us. What an opportunity this sport gives to so many Americans and especially black Americans. He says, instead, we're going to honor Jacob Blake, George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, Eric Garner, Michael Brown, Rayshard Brooks, and many other alleged victims of police brutality. We're going to make victims of poor decision-making heroes and martyrs. We're going to reflect on death, despair, and desperation. Yes, what a contrast to 2001. And Jason Whitlock says here, and listen to this. He says, this is satanic. This is satanic what's going on. This is, this is a sports commentator. Now, granted, he's, uh, he's pretty much alone on an island. But he's say, this is a black commentator saying this is satanic. He says, sports Christmas has been turned into a satanic ritual focused on tragic life endings of a handful of criminal suspects. Here we are, just like Candace Owens says, we're, we're holding up criminal suspects as our heroes. He's saying, look, it's NFL, we should be celebrating some of these sports heroes that, that weren't criminals, by the way. Instead, it's this. It's satanic, he says. He goes on to write later on, football exemplified America at its best. Now football, like the rest of sports, and like Hollywood, is pivoting to wagging a finger and scolding the people the media classify as intellectually impure. The whole country is overdosing on anger and misery. The whole country, we've OD'd on anger and misery. Negative, hateful, divisive, strife. Anger. These are the moods on the streets of America today. It says here, the whole country is overdosing on anger and misery. What can we celebrate? Not football, not Labor Day. Everything is an excuse to suck in more bitterness, anger, and misery. We must focus on death abuse, and wickedness. And Whitlock says, it's all satanic. (laughs) It's all satanic. It's the mainstreaming of evil. Good for him. Good for Jason Whitlock. Speaking out with a, a pretty bold column in response to all of this nonsense you see in the NBA, in the NFL, Switching back to the American greatness, it says, it's talking about some of the history, you know, and it makes the point that when 9-11 happened, it was like that, you know, and within within hours you knew, I forget how many it was, 2,700, 2,800 were dead. I guess you didn't know the the final tally over the course of a few hours, but, but the point of it is the strike, the attack, it was over and the buildings were smoldering within hours. And, that, and then it was America banding together. Then it was America, as you read or heard at the top of the show. America coming together, reflecting, joining arm in arm, appreciating family. This was the reaction. 
Now you compare this with the slow motion crisis that has continued through the course of this year and how it just keeps getting worse and worse and more angry and divisive and bitter. Even if the casualty count isn't yet as high and it hasn't happened in a couple of hours, but it's happening over the course of days and weeks. And in the case of Portland, it's stretching into months. Months of mob activity. Rioters in the streets. When will be the next incident that triggers another mob, another angry mob to destroy a city? So much misery. So much suffering. This American Greatness piece says, and then came 2020. In the midst of an unprecedented unprecedented pandemic lockdown, America exploded. In response to a random incident in Minneapolis involving a wayward cop and a career criminal, neither of whom had anyone ever heard of, left-wing extremists rioted in major cities, committed acts of arson, vandalism, and even murder, while Democratic mayors and governors refused to send in police. The media insisted the violence wasn't happening, drastically played down its scale and import, or blamed it on Donald Trump. That's what we've been living through these past few months. And as this American Greatness piece concludes, suddenly 9-11 seems almost quaint. Yes, those attacks had been horrific, but they were over by 10 a.m., This new nightmare appeared never to end. This new nightmare, the nightmare of 2020, it feels like it's never, ever, ever going to end. It's just going to be a slow motion crisis that gradually accelerates into full-scale war. When that happens, remember where you heard it. Remember the prophecies in Ezekiel 4 and 5. Now would be the time to wake up to eliminate those distractions, to put our faith and our trust in God, to put our noses in the Bible. God bless America, is he? Is he blessing America? It says, on 9-11, America had been targeted by 19 foreign fanatics in the grip of religious ideology that was, uh, at that point, still largely alien to the United States. Now, in 2020... America is under siege by thousands of its own, all driven by radical ideas that had spread to almost every classroom in the country. What a different time we're in today. So much self-hate now. So many radicals and fanatics on the inside now. They're not trying to get in from Saudi Arabia or Iran and Iraq to learn how to fly a plane so that they can attack some of our iconic buildings. These are homegrown terrorists. These are homegrown agitators. These are homegrown violent criminals that hate the United States of America. They're not going to fly the flag. They're going to rip it to shreds. They're going to burn the flag. They're going to walk the streets of America and say death to America. What a contrast between 2001 and 2020. When we come back, we'll continue on with our, our study on giving up the world. You're listening to Stephen Flurry, and this is the Trumpet Daily Radio Show. If you'd like to email the program, you can send comments to td at kpcg.fm. We'll be right back. This is KPCG-FM, and this is the Trumpet Daily. Freedom is one of the most sought-after ideals in human history. Man's search for freedom has taken him into the fiercest of protests, struggles, revolutions, civil wars, and even world wars. Today, in the midst of free societies, Many continue to fight for what they perceive as ever greater freedoms. And yet, many of these same people are actively fighting against law. Few people understand that this war against law 
actually undermines true freedom. To learn more, request Gerald Flurry's booklet, No Freedom Without Law. In this free booklet, you will see what the Bible says about the latter-day spirit of rebellion and lawlessness that is now so common in our nations today. Also request America Under Attack. In this booklet, you will learn more about the spirit behind this attack on law. You'll see where this is leading. Both booklets are offered freely at no cost or obligation to you. Request No Freedom Without Law and America Under Attack. Email your request to td at kpcg.fm or visit thetrumpet.com. From the Philadelphia Church of God campus in Edstone, England, this is the Trumpet Daily Program with Stephen Flurry. Let me just squeeze in this uh, email here to begin with in this uh, segment. It says here, this is in response to yesterday's show, I can feel the deep intensity of God's speaking through you, and I keep hearing sirens, bells, and all kinds of warning signals. They're just screaming at the highest level I'd ever known or heard. I used to attend the church a number of years back and can see in this very program exactly what God's been trying so hard to wake up inside of me. I've been so very unresponsive because of the incredibly stubborn self that I've been fighting like crazy inside. I hate that I'm so difficult to push and force and just shut down any distraction. Oh, how incredibly hard it is to shut out the noise of our own little worlds and this world and all of it designed specifically to simply cause us to fritter away time. Time is the one thing God requires of us. And if we're giving it all away to video games, websites, online shopping and research, that has nothing to do with God's word or work? How does one get close to God by getting busy with everything but? It says, well, I've unceremoniously been hit hard between the eyes today. I was going to just watch a half hour before going to bed as I have to get up uh, at 4 a.m. for work. However, I was so riveted by this program, I couldn't shut it off. So four and a half hours of sleep it is. God demands time, and that's impressed upon me tonight like I've never felt in a long time. I literally felt God's eyes looking directly into mine through this talk that you gave today. I must watch this again on the Sabbath. So that's someone writing, in response to giving up this world, the study that we've gone through the last couple of days, 1 Timothy 4 and verse 6, yesterday we finished off going through, let me just see, what verses did we cover last? Oh yes, John 6, where it talked about gathering up all the fragments after that, that uh, astounding miracle of the bread and the fishes, the loaves of bread, Christ fe feeding miraculously thousands of people, just like God miraculously fed millions of people in ancient Israel, manna from heaven. And that's what spiritual food is. It's miraculous that we can have this, that we can dine on God's truth, that we can have our minds open to the truth, that we can come out of the world and into God's church and fill up on spiritual food. 1 Timothy 4, 6, it says, If you put the brethren in remembrance of these things, you shall be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith, and of good doctrine, whereunto you have attained, nourished up in these precious words, these health-building words, nurtured on the truth of God. Good doctrine. It's good for us. It's good food. It's, it's a healthy diet. Verse 7, this is Paul's instruction to Timothy, his assistant, his evangelist. It says, But refuse profane and old wives' fables, and exercise yourself... Rather unto godliness, for bodily exercise profits for a little while, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. There's some temporary profit to physical exercise, but spiritual exercise, there's a real payoff, Paul says. 
We're talking about eternal rewards in God's kingdom. It's worth it putting in the time. It's worth it making this investment. Verse 11 says, these things command and teach. And verse 12, let no man despise your youth. He's saying this to Timothy. But be you an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity or love, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Don't worry about your youth. Don't worry about your young age. Just get out there, he says to Timothy. Just get out there and set a good example. Show the brethren how to live. Verse 13 says, Till I come, give attendance to reading, exhortation, and to doctrine. So make sure that you also study. Make sure you also put in your time at the desk. Give attendance there means to attach yourselves to. So give attendance or attach yourself to reading, to study, to exhortation, to doctrine. From this book I mentioned a couple shows ago, Nicholas Carr's book, The Shallows. You'll recall I talked about his, uh, his interview on a recent podcast and the fact that the book is now 10 years old and how he came along and updated it recently. And how he said that, boy, when you look at the the book 10 years ago, it's all the more needed today, given the gadgets, given the smartphone technology and such. He writes in the shallows, and keep in mind, this is a little outdated now. It says, most Americans, no matter what their age, spend at least eight and a half hours a day looking at television, a computer monitor, or the screen, or, or their mobile device. Frequently, they use two or even all three of the devices simultaneously. Hours and hours of it. And again, in the book, he doesn't even get into content. For the most part, he's just talking about the the effect the technology has on us. You add to that the despicable content. Next, Netflix has this movie out called Cuties, and it's about 11-year-old girls with all of these sexual gestures and dances on the screen. The sexual exploitation of preteens. It's out there for all to see. Yeah, right. I guess in the Me Too movement, that's okay. It's okay for that. Harry and Meghan, they joined on with Netflix. We know the Obamas are there. Susan Rice, they're on the board. These are high-powered Democrats after all. I guess they're just fine with cuties. Nothing cute about it, is there? It's disgusting. We proudly display our sins like Sodom and Gomorrah. That's what Isaiah says. We put it right out there on display for all to see. We're proud of it. Oh, and then the left-wing rags that weigh in saying, this is, I mean, this is award-worthy. We've never seen anything like this. Semi-naked 11-year-old girls. Never seen anything like this. Imagine that. And here are these warped minds that say, yeah, yeah, this is, I think this is pretty, well, it's almost innovative. What a trailblazer this director is. This is new. This is unique. This is sickening. Verse 15, it says, meditate upon these things. Give yourself wholly to them that your profiting may appear to all. Practice. Give attendance to reading and then put it into practice. Think on these things. Meditate and, 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 and give yourself wholly to these things, as it says. And then Paul says in verse 16, Take heed unto yourself and to the doctrine. Continue in them. So stay the course. Read, study, but then put it into practice. We've got to be doers of the word as well. James 1, 21 and 22. We've got to be doers of the law. If we do that, you're setting the right example. It's going to help others come right into the kingdom of God. I mentioned this example yesterday, the Bereans. I don't think I read it, but we went through it recently in epistles class here at the college. Acts 17, 10, it says, And and the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who, coming there, went into the synagogue of the Jews. It says, these, these people of Berea, they were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they which, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. 
They searched the scriptures daily. This is why the Bible Correspondence Course is just an outstanding prod for you to keep your nose in the Bible. There's certainly other ways and means by which you can study, give attendance to reading, just going through our books and booklets for sure. The great thing about the Correspondence Course, you can leave off on question four at page nine, writing the first verse out of three that you're supposed to write, and then you can come right back to it the next day and pick up right where you left off and just carry on with your study. You don't have to have those moments of, oh, what should I read? What should I study? It's a a pre-prepared plan, a plan for you that takes you right through the thread of the Bible and gives you understanding and knowledge. God does take note of those who are more, more noble in their Bible study. In the Living Hope book, it says this, why was Peter, this is my father writing, why was Peter chosen as chief apostle? One of the major reasons was that he knew the Bible. Are you known as a, a person who really knows his or her Bible? Christ said we would be accountable for every word. We read that yesterday, didn't we? Well, the example was gather up every fragment where it says live by every word. I believe that's in Matthew 5. But really, you see the same principle in John 6. Live by every word. It says the Bible is Jesus Christ in print. What a mind-jarring blessing this book is for God's very elect. We must know the mind of God and be deeply grounded in the Bible in order to have the hope that we need. The Bible, this Bible that we study, it's God's instruction manual. It's the instruction manual that comes from our maker. God sent it with his creation and says, here, here's how everything operates. Here's how we're to live. Here are, here are the priorities. I, I mean, you need an instruction manual to try to figure out how to work a, a TV or a video game box or whatever it is. Most people don't read those, I I know. But just like most people don't read the Bible. Here's the instruction manual that shows us, that teaches us how to live. And yet for, for, for most people, the overwhelming majority of people today, and billions of them have Bibles, but they're just collecting dust on the back shelf. They're, they're just props, like these, these books behind me here. They're never pulled off the shelf. They're never really studied. Herbert Armstrong knew our maker's instruction book. He knew it. He used it. He quoted from the Bible. He took you through scriptures. He taught from God's word. He gave us the meaning because God inspired him. Now this, I mean, this represents a a monumental transformation to go someone to go from someone who is steeped in this world and the ways of this world and all of the things of this world and all of the broadcasts in this world and the technologies of this world to give it all up and to think and to act to behave like God in his book The Shallows Mr. Carr says that well because of this impact of the media revolution that our brains, and you heard the listener who wrote about this yesterday, our brains, he says, have been rewired. It's like they've been rewired to think just purely on a superficial level. And and you look at the evil spilling into the streets of America. You hear the comments coming from these young people. These are poor, poor people who are just ignorant of God's truth. They're just being guided by emotion. Well, that's putting it nicely. There's a spirit behind it, of course. Whipped up into emotion. Emotional overreactions. Angry reactions. Actions of rage and hatred. Here is our president, someone says, in a very nice angel of light sound. Yes, he's guilty of uh, negligent genocide the President of the United States. Next, yes, he's guilty of murder on a mass scale. Next, 
and on and on it goes. What a difference. 2001, 2020. 2001 wasn't God's world by any means. But it certainly makes you think about 2 Timothy 3. Evil men and seducers will what in the lead up to Christ's return? They will wax worse and worse. Are we seeing that? Have we seen that? We certainly are. This is the the strong pull that we've got to break free from with God's help. Romans 12 and verse 2 says, And be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect uh, will of God. Don't let the, the world around you squeeze you into its mold, says another translation. Don't let the world around you squeeze you into its mold. Push and remove the worldliness from out of your body so that God can create in you a new creation reproducing himself. When we come back, we'll conclude today's program with a couple more emails. You're listening to Stephen Fleury, and this is the Trumpet Daily Radio Show. If you'd like to send in feedback, td at kpcg.fm. We'll be right back. This is KPCG-FM, and this is the Trumpet Daily. Are we living in the last days? Some dismiss the notion as fanatical, but world leaders and news analysts are issuing warnings that are becoming more and more dire. Could Bible prophecies about the last days actually be accurate? Our brochure can help guide you through the relevant news and history and help you compare these events to what the Bible says. Are we living in the last days? This brochure is available for free right now at thetrumpet.com. From the Philadelphia Church of God campus in Edstone, England, this is the Trumpet Daily Program with Stephen Flurry. One listener sends in a COVID mask obsession update from Trinidad and Tobago, way down in Trinidad Trinidad and Tobago. It says one of the strictures is families living together in the same home, even if just husband and wife, must wear a mask if they are together in their private vehicle. <laughs> husband and wife, strap on the mask. Another one, if your garbage can is on the edge of a public road, then you must wear a mask to tape take your garbage to the bin. Failure to do so is punishable by law. Can't even walk out to the garbage bin on your own without strapping on a mask. Here's another. This is Trinidad, Trinidad and Tobago. If, you're, if a child over the age of eight is found to be out in public alone without a face mask, they can be charged $1,000 in the first in- instance under the new public health ordinance. So if you're over eight, thousand bucks. Eight years old, our listener writes, an eight-year-old child with COVID-related criminal intent. You couldn't make this stuff up, even if you tried. What a world we live in, or rather exist in. As I study Mr. Armstrong's booklet, The Wonderful World Tomorrow, how can one not yearn for that day? Another one here says, just want to tell you how much my husband and I enjoy your daily program. We listen on the the way to and from work and anywhere we get the chance. What a blessing to get a real perspective on the crazy events of this sick, evil, perverted world. Unfortunately, we don't watch the video version much, but we will have to start as this bird feeder thing has piqued our interest. Well, there you go. They're missing on some of the video excitement, the exciting video that Sam prepares One last one here from Texas. It says, I've been meaning to email gratitude for for you mentioning during SEP that the campers were handwriting the Bible Correspondence Course Lesson 24 on rulership. I decided to do the same, and it was so wonderful to rediscover handwriting the scriptures, as I did many years ago when I first took the BCC. Now I have fallen in love with my daily ritual, and after completing that lesson, I began number 12, 
which I should complete this week. Sure, it takes longer to get through each lesson, but the process is very, very rewarding. There is definitely a different dimension in writing out the verses. Your mind thinks about what you are writing. It helps the memory to read the verse, then try and write out as much as I can from memory. And if I think I know the verse, I'll write it before reading it and then see if I got it right. She says, there is the added value of helping my penmanship as well. (laughs) Lots of benefits to go around with writing out the Armstrong College Bible Correspondence Course. You're listening to Stephen Flurry, and this is the Trumpet Daily Radio Show. If you'd like to email the program, send comments to td at kpcg.fm. We thank you for joining us on today's show. We thank you for joining us all week, and we'll see you Monday.